Good afternoon, um, Greg Maymaris, and I'm going to talk to you about turbulence reporting, um, observational, sorry, observational turbulence reporting um, at NCAR. Uh, the first, I'm going to give two presentations. One is for Larry Corman. The first one, though, is on um, the in situ EDR. So, you know, Aircraft-based turbulence observations are truly important uh, for everything that we do. So all turbulence products require some truth, right? You can't forecast what you don't know. So you need some sort of an observation. And uh, so uh, it's also important, obviously, for things like pilots for situational awareness. But that, that this was one of the driving forces of why we got into the in-situ business. Without obs aircraft observations, we really have no idea. So the first aircraft observation that we had was uh, the PIREP, and this goes back all the way to uh, the Wright brothers, of course, for those in the know. Um, and so that, but there's a lot of problems with PIREPs. I probably don't need to belabor this, but they're non-uniform in reporting in space and time. They're generally low occurrence. Uh, there's Big, there can be very large position and time inaccuracies, you know, 100 kilometers, 20 minutes. If you go through a big event, you don't have time to, to actually make a report. You're, you're too busy taking care of the, uh, the aircraft. Um, they're subject, uh, subjective and categorical. Um, they're aircraft dependent. Um, so, you know, a moderate for a heavy aircraft might be a severe for a light. So leading to difficulties in translating. Uh, so better would be a, an automated atmospheric measure, aircraft independent, so on. Um, so the, the one that we've, uh, you know, is being used in the, the aviation industry is eddy dissipation rate. It's, you know, in physics world, it's really energy dissipation rate, but eddy is, is there and it, it's, it's fine. Um, it's easier to share and translate to a specific aircraft, just like, you know, a wave height is better to, to talk about from ship to ship as opposed to, you know, calm and rough seas and that sort of thing. Uh, they're relevant for scales of turbulence which affect aircraft. So that's actually, this is really important. Um, you know, this, this metric is good for, you know, uh, interpreting how an aircraft is going to feel. So very large, very small scales of turbulence are not felt as turbulence by the passengers, the aircraft, so forth. And it's sufficient to fully characterize the atmospheric turbulence at these scales. No other parameters are needed. Um, so to address the issues related to these PIREPs, the FAA sponsored in situ activities for almost 30 years now um, through both the AWRP and WIDIC programs. The output is EDR, as we've talked about. Uh, it's really epsilon to the one-third it's the cube root of eddy dissipation rate. Uh, typically, the values are between zero and one. Doesn't, there's no actual upper bound there. Um, on Jupiter, you might have much larger EDR values. Uh, and the uh, EDR to the one third, epsilon to the one third EDR scales nicely with the wind. So as you double the winds, you get twice the eddy dissipation rate. Um, and that's why we use that. So current users in the US uh, include Delta, Southwest, United, American, internationally, there's Swiss, Aer Lingus, Qantas, Air France, Cathay, uh, Qatar, and many more actually. Uh, current aircraft types, 777s from uh, Boeing, 777s, 87s, 737NGs, Maxes, 67s, um, Airbus, uh, A320s, A330s, A350s, they're deployed on a series of systems. Uh, the ACMS is the most common system that it's uh, put on. It's the aircraft, I forget exactly, aircraft condition monitoring system, I think, um, by Honeywell Teledyne. Um, it's actually, now I, should, I need to update that because the, uh, so the A350s, for example, have it on a, a there's a different box, I think, Sagem. Uh, EFBs, uh, AIDs, so Aer Lingus, for example, put it on their EFB. That's actually where the software is running. Uh, AIDs and also available offline. On the right here, we have the the view of the how the uh, EDR counts have evolved over time, starting 2009 here, and it's, as it's moved uh, progresses, you can see as fleets come in and out, and even in uh, 2000, uh, 2020, there's a you could see the drop in rates as the COVID hit. Uh, the WIDIC program funded the development of the technology transfer package. So a lot of funding came from AWRP, but this is uh, the main where, where uh, WIDIC really came in was this tech transfer package. 
Uh, and the idea was to simplify the integration of the software into uh, an operational system. Uh, open source package includes the onboard software itself, obviously. There's also offline tuning and ver verification software uh, in MATLAB. There's ground-based report ingest and QC software. There's documentation. Uh, the direct users of the package have been um, Teledyne, Boeing, Airbus, Delta, Aer Lingus, and others. Now, most other airlines uh, obtain their software from these sources. They don't actually use the tech transfer package directly. So you can kind of think of it as the, the experts, the people that are actually doing the integration do it. But there are some airlines like Delta, especially, uh, and Aer Lingus that have taken it on themselves. Um, there are others as well. Uh, available from Mencar. Uh, it's also available from IATA, and uh, IATA does provide, uh, provide additional uh, support and services, including the Turbulence Aware uh, platform for sharing the EDR data. They also do you know, assistance with building business cases, and uh, they also have an EFB uh, viewer that, that can be used. The NCAR algorithm uh, uses a, a Wind-based approach. That's the. There was an older version that that didn't do that, but the newer version, which has been around for a long time, you know, 2005-ish, 2008-ish, uh, uses vertical winds. Um, so a vertical wind time series is estimated primarily using the true airspeed and angle of attack, which functionally acts like an anemometer. Actually, uh, using this, we can estimate the turbulence in an aircraft in an aircraft independent way. Um, note that there are some aircraft dependent parameters involved to compute the EDR. You know, you can't take the aircraft out of the, the system completely. Um, uh, but I will say that it's really important to note that the response of the aircraft is not used in this, um, in this algorithm. So, you know, we're not using acceleration. So that's not something that's, that's uh, part of the system. To save on communication costs, we use a uh, event triggering logic. Um, so, you know, when an event is identified, the logic triggers a downlink of report. Uh, but it's also important to know, as was brought up earlier, you know, when the air algorithm is working properly, but there's no or very light turbulence going on, then we want to have those routine reports so we can see, you know, we can interpolate between and, and say, so on the right here uh, in this figure, on the left side of the figure, there's a track where the aircraft is experiencing, you know, not much turbulence anyways. And so you, all you see are these routine reports, which happen to be every 15 minutes in this case. On the north route, northbound route, there's actually some turbulence. And so you're getting, you know, clusters of data as it tries to report in such a way that it captures the, the whole event. Current use cases, uh, well, operations, you know, it's an input into GTGN. It's displayed directly on EFB apps, for example, Delta's flight weather viewer or IATA's uh, viewer, um, used by airline meteorology. And I probably should also put in dispatch, right? It's used. Uh, aviation med offices, for example, AWC. Um, it's also used in research and development. So development, tuning, verification of algorithms, such as what we have here in-house, GTG, GTGN, Global GTG, NTDA, satellite-based uh, products. It's using case studies. On the right here, we have a nice case study of NTDA with overlaid in situ reports, um, and also for climatologies. Uh, moving on into a little bit more into operations, a number of airlines are using this and they use a various, you know, they're using various approaches and display technologies. Um, I happen to be, uh, I'm going to go a little bit into the Delta one. It's from an old presentation, it's a little older. Um, but, you know, what we, the, the feedback they received from Delta, this is, I think, specifically from Bill Watts, but, but you know, late subjective and insufficient pyre ups led to outcome, uh, poor outcomes in two areas or safety, obviously. And then they would be wild and often unnecessary altitude deviations as pilots uh, seek for better rides using bad information obtained in an ATC chat room. And then these deviations in turn led to an in, efficient use of on-route airspace and or reduction in on-route NAS capacity. So, you know, essentially, you know, my best understanding is, is that they use, you know, both the you know, GTGN, which is in the product, but also the in situ observations to actually help them find 
you know, smooth air. So they're deciding on if to make an, an altitude deviation, for example, you know, using information that there's actually available to them instead of just going off of what's in the ATC chat room. Uh, current focus areas, continue to evaluate the data quality of new and existing EDR data feeds and mitigate as necessary. Uh, continue to promote further deployments of the in-situ EDR software. And then probably the one of the biggest, most important thing we're going forward with is this EDR standardization slash harmonization effort that uh, some people actually in this audience are involved with. And that's to ensure operational comparability of different in-situ EDR algorithms, not just the NCAR EDR algorithm, although that's certainly part of it, but there's there's a number of other ones. And so, you know, is a 0.2 from this one the same as a 0.4 from this one? You know, you need to figure all that out, and that's really important in order to make uh, uh, use of this data in, in a shared platform. And so this is primarily through the RTCA Special Committee 206 and also its ad groups. Uh, and that's all I have on this part of the talk. Is there any questions? All right, and if not, then I'll move on to the ADSB work. Uh, so this is uh, this presentation was by Larry. I'm just standing in, uh, Larry Kornman. Um, so kind of hit on some of this, but turbulence counters continue to be a significant operational problem. And so, you know, given that turbulence is so variable and spatially and temporally, you know, really you need large numbers of observations. Uh, ADS-B is an aircraft position velocity reporting system that has the potential to really augment existing turbulence observations. Um, so the really big benefit is, is that there are really large numbers of aircraft that are, that are out there that are available. So, you know, most aircraft in the U.S. controlled airspace are now required to have ADS-B out. Um, as of February 1st, there were, you know, almost 160,000 U.S. aircraft reporting, including 108,000 uh, fixed wing GA. And, you know, compare that to what we have for in situ, where there's something more like 1,600 aircraft that are reporting in situ EDR. And, you know, all summed to together, there's only about 1,200 turbulence pyreps per day on average. Um, there's very good spatial and temporal accuracy with this ADSB, right? That's the whole point. Um, aircraft side of implementation is already happening. So if we can make use of the data that's coming down, then you know it, it's it's really almost a, a free free uh, benefit. So how does it work? So the aircraft, there's some turbulence. The aircraft flies through the turbulence, and you get a vertical rate positions or vertical rate. Uh, data coming out. So the way the algorithm works is to go backwards, right? We have the vertical winds or the vertical rates, and we need to just try to infer what the turbulence was that gave us those, those vertical rates. Um, now I want to stress that there are, there, there may be some confusion. I just want to make sure that there, uh, we, we settle this is that there is a separate effort for ADSB in which there's this thing called ADSB weather in which an onboard in situ turbulence uh, observation can be downlinked via ADSB and that's really a totally separate piece of uh, effort what we're doing is talk talking about just taking the regular old vertical or sorry velocity messages from the ADSB that exists already already out there and trying to infer turbulence from that this would be something, yeah, well, anyways, I think that's good. So there's already been some lessons learned from the algorithm development so far. This is a project that is, you know, in, in very much in the development stage, right? So there's already been some lessons learned. Uh, extracting accurate turbulence information uh, from the ADSB vertical rate requires that we deal with low sampling rates. You know, for, for us, we're used to more like eight to 10 samples per second. At best, we're getting about one sample per second generally. Uh, there's large quantization of the data, you know, 64 feet per minute, which is about a third of a meter per second for the vertical rate. And so when you combine those two together, that's a serious degradation of the data that we can make use of. 
Um, there is maneuver and uh, wave contamination in the data, right? So from our standpoint, we want turbulence. We don't want maneuvers, but a maneuver can look like, you know, turbulence potentially. And same thing with waves. Um, and then we have to really worry a lot about the scaling differences for different aircraft types and, op, you know, um, flight conditions, right? So qualitative assessment of uh, the case studies that we've been doing so far, event detection in general is very good um, in terms of timing and seeing something. Uh, we certainly get overestimates and underestimates. So the overestimates seem to be coming from maneuver uh, transitions. So, you know, during climb out uh, periods, especially. Uh, short wave events will look like turbulence where the in-situ EDR will, won't think that there's any turbulence there, but the ADSB system is saying, hey, that looks like turbulence. Um, underestimates are coming from over filtering. You have to filter the data because it's got this quantization noise, for example, and so you have to filter it. And so you get some underestimates there. Uh, resampling issues, you're losing data because of the sampling. Um, and you have to, you, you get this data that's not equally spaced. The, the ADSB data is kind of, it's not randomly spaced, but it's, it's irregular in how you get it. So you have to normalize it out into this grid. And so you sometimes that introduces uh, issues. Uh, sampling, quantization, and then also there may be some issues with scale factors. Again, this is work in progress, it's all development. So we think that many of these discrepancies can be mitigated with some, um, with algorithm improvements. Couple case studies. Uh, so just on the top right plot here, this is a time series of, uh, so time goes from left to right. Uh, EDR is, is the vertical scale. The black is the EDR coming from our truth, which is the in situ EDR data that I already presented earlier. The red line is the EDR that we're getting from the ADSB algorithm, the, this prototype EDR algorithm. And so you can actually see here, we're getting a little bit of an overestimate, but the main actual turbulence event, this is during climb out, by the way. And then as the system, uh, as the aircraft is flying along, there's this big turbulence event, a reasonable turbulence event, and uh, the ADSB algorithm is actually matching really quite well with the uh, EDR. On the bottom here, this is just another kind of view of it. The colors here are the intensity. So th this is altitude. So these kind of <laughs> uh, old Band-Aid color is the altitude. You know, so you, you see the climb out here on the left. And then on the this middle track is the in situ EDR values for the, the larger, hotter colors are larger EDR values. And then this is for the uh, ADSB EDR. And so you can see that they're, you know, they're not exactly the same, but they, they certainly capture a lot of the same events. Um, you do see some overestimates here. Another case study uh, during, um, actually during climb out, there actually was some turbulence and the, the, the match between, again, the in situ EDR and the ADSB EDR is uh, really quite good. And then here you see, actually, you can see the altitude. They, they changed altitudes. Um, and this, and that actually triggered a little bit of a false alarm here. Um, and then as there was some more turbulence at the end of the flight, uh, that you actually do see that the two match again very well. In the short term, um, we are interested in, you know, we need to figure out things like what is the criteria needed for an operational demo, for a you know good enough operational demo, what what what, uh, and who makes? <laughs> we need help making this decision. You know who makes this decision. So what types of demos are are appropriate slash required? You know, do we want to do an offline demo with canned data, uh, or uh, an online uh, demo with canned data? Online with a limited distribution or a wider distribution? Who's operating these demos? That's, this is all still to be determined. What product is being demoed exactly? So as somebody brought up earlier, there's, there, there, this is potential to have a, a tremendous amount of data and you probably can't show all of it to, to somebody. You, you're going to have to distill it down. Um, is it distilled into some product like a GTGN or do you try to merge into a single product, uh, you know, a 3D uh, graded product? 
that that gives the best notion of pyre ups, you know, electronic pyre ups or what. Uh, longer term, you still have this kind of similar questions, but you know, for operational deployment, you know, um, you know, who's going to who's going to be the operator of that ADSB turbulence algorithm? Um, what are the vehicles for getting this data out to users? Um, some other things like you know, what's truth here? Is is in situ EDR the truth? Is 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 a favorable favorable comparison to in situ EDR the sole criterion? Um, what about things like wave like cases? Um, you know, they they might actually be considered turbulence if you were flying in it, even though in situ isn't seeing it. So you know, what do we do about things like that? Um, event based scoring seems to be appropriate, and and um, this is actually a really big issue. This last one potentially is, is, you know, how do we move forward with other aircraft types when there is no in situ EDR for comparison? There's a number of aircraft types that don't have in situ EDR. So, uh, you know, what do you do there? We don't have a truth for that. Um, 